Good morning, Trinity. It's 9.30 in the morning here on Sunday. We are in new terrain, so bear with us as we experiment and try technology. For this particular week, we will share the prayer of the day and the sermon. If we continue to maintain social distancing into the future, in these next few weeks, we may actually do the entire liturgy together so that you can at least share in these words with me from this space and from your home. Friends, let us pray. Lord who listens, our troubling thoughts and dreads whisper through our daily tasks. Transform our motivation from fear to love. Break us of our destructive habits and bring us to wholeness, to trust fully in your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Our gospel for this weekend comes from John. We are in the fourth chapter. I will only read a portion of it for you. If you want to read it at home, it is John chapter 4, verses 4 through 42. I'm going to grab a segment out of the middle of it, starting at verse 19. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to the woman, Believe, to me, believe me, woman, though a time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know, because salvation is from the Jewish people. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. The Father looks for those who worship with him in this way. God is spirit, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. The Samaritan woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will teach everything to us. Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We do not like being alone. Even the most introverted among us still like to get out. We like to maybe have a meal somewhere. We like to visit with family, with some of our beloved friends, sit around a table and drink some wine or drink a beer or maybe a cup of coffee or tea. We like the social interaction, even if for some of us we are hardwired to be on our own. We do not like being alone. So this is strange territory for us. You might be watching this on your phone or on your tablet, or you might be watching this on the computer on your dining room table. I'm standing in a space that's built to hold many, many people, and I'm here by myself, and my voice is just bouncing off the walls. This is strange. We do not like being alone. We are built by God to be part of a community, to be part of a tribe, to be part of a family, to be part of a much broader existence than just ourselves. There are many reasons why we do not like being alone. One of the reasons why we do not like being alone is because when we are by ourselves, that sometimes when the thoughts start moving through our heads, the thoughts that we don't like, the thoughts that make us uncomfortable, the thoughts that might drive us into a despair or to an anxiety or into a worry that we don't need. So we're gathered together here using social media and the technology that we have at hand on this particular Sunday morning, inadequate as it may be, and hopefully adequate enough that we can spend a little time together reflecting on what God is doing in our lives. And we come to this particular gospel from John chapter 4, and we're hanging out with Jesus because, of course, we want to hear what Jesus has to say. Maybe we can gather a little bit of wisdom and hope and comfort from his words. And we come to discover that Jesus is encountered by a fearless, dynamic, powerfully intelligent woman, who, by the way, in the course of their conversation, leads Jesus to offer us a vision of our relationship with God. We didn't read the whole story, but we would find out if we read the whole story that at the very beginning, this Samaritan woman, and by the way, it's unfortunate that she is only ever called the Samaritan woman in this story. This is one of the tragic elements of scriptures that women often go unnamed so you know what? Actually, let's fix that. Let's, let's give her a name. She's a good Samaritan. We don't have anything better to go by, so let's just call her Sam. At least now we can recognize that she has an identity. She has a place. She is a living, breathing human just like you and me. And she is fearless. And she goes out to a well, John tells us, in the middle of the day, the heat of the day, 
And she's going out to this well and she sees Jesus off in the distance. Now, for her, it is perfectly reasonable to have a little bit of me too moment going in the back of her mind. She is by herself. Here's this dude sta standing out there. She can't quite see the halo around his head and the beautiful hair and, and shiny teeth that tell her that it's Jesus. So she doesn't quite know yet who this guy is. She just knows that there's some dude hanging out of the well and she's heading out there. Now you and I can also make a whole bunch of presumptions. And we know from reading devotions and Bible studies and scholarship material, for those of us who enjoy to read that, we know that a multitude of people have made assumptions about why this woman is going to the well in the middle of the day, the heat of the day, to go get water. Now John tells us explicitly why she is going to that well. She's thirsty. She needs water. It's really as simple as that. She needs water. She's going to a well because a well has water. She's going out to this well and she can see this guy out there and really she probably shouldn't go out there only because it would be just her and this guy by themselves and she goes anyway because she's fearless and she needs water. She goes out to the well, gets all the way out there and she names the divide between herself and Jesus. And maybe it has a little bit of gender role built into it. She's a woman and he's a man. And so there is a little bit of that. But she really names is the social distance that is expected to exist between herself, a Samaritan woman, and Jesus, who is a Jewish man. This is about a whole lot more than just gender identity. This is about culture. These two cultures are not supposed to be interacting with each other. They are not supposed to talk to each other. They cer certainly should not be carrying on a conversation that lasts for 40 verses, if not longer. But she's fearless. She persists. She names the issue right from the very beginning. We should not be sharing water with each other because I am a Samaritan and you are Jewish. Now, in the course of this conversation, we get to hear some words like living water, springs of water that remind those of us with a great depth of Christian understanding that Jesus is probably talking about baptism, even though Jesus doesn't really talk about baptism. But, you know, Jesus always loves to have more than one theme going on at one time with a particular word. So he's talking about our relationship with God. He's talking about living waters. They also happen to be standing by a well, and Jesus is really, really good at taking some image or some icon or some object that is near him and transforming it into a much deeper well of understanding. So he's talking about living waters. She becomes fascinated, and they continue the conversation. But we remember this conversation started with her naming what stands between them. We continue on in this conversation, and again, I invite you to go home, or you are home, I invite you to read this at home, John chapter 4, just read the whole chapter, it's a fascinating chapter, she's an amazing character. Sam continues talking to Jesus, and Jesus keeps talking to Sam, and then Sam and Jesus, in the course of this conversation, we get to learn a little bit more about who Sam is, Jesus' names, that she's been married multiple times before. Now again, in our Bible studies and in our devotions, we may have read, scholarship we may have on our shelves that we have read, have told us that we need to create some presumptions and some assumptions about Sam. But here's what Scripture shows us. Jesus doesn't seem to care. What Jesus is doing is Jesus is naming this woman's identity. Jesus knows this woman. Jesus knows you. And Jesus interacts with us and encounters us and comes into our life without judgment. Sometimes the judgment that we are looking for is the judgment that we create in our own minds when we're sitting by ourselves and we're dwelling in our thoughts. Or we're watching TV and we're watching others out on the screens or on the tablets and we're generating thoughts about them. Jesus has none of that. In this interaction with Jesus, Jesus simply says who she is. And this is enough for Sam. She stays on board in this conversation. She hasn't left the well yet. She could easily have done that at any point. But she stays. They continue to talk. And as they're talking, 
This woman who is now intrigued by this guy with the halo around his head and the perfect hair and beautiful teeth, she's starting to see that maybe it's not just some dude who's standing at a well waiting for people to show up so he can have a weird conversation with them. Maybe this guy is a prophet. And we know from Scripture that prophets speak on behalf of God. So now she's starting to get more of a glimpse of who Jesus is. You and I have the inside track, so we know a little bit more than her. But Sam is starting to put the pieces together. This guy is somehow significant in her relationship with God. And now that we're thinking about God, and now we're talking about God, then she goes right to the heart again of what divides her, a Samaritan woman, from Jesus, who is a Jewish man. This shows her deep and profound intelligence and her fearlessness, and how dynamic she is, because she starts talking about her faith, and how her faith has told her to worship God on this mountain, where apparently her and Jesus are hanging out. She points to it. It's right here. Something worth knowing about the Samaritan people and the Jewish people, just a little bit of context. Samaritan people and the Jewish people more or less started out on the same path. There was probably bloodlines and and tribal relationships that were there, but then the Assyrians came along, and now we're talking like 600 years before Jesus and Sam are hanging out at this well. 600 years before that, the Assyrian army comes through and and destroys the northern kingdom, and then the Babylonian army comes along, and they destroy the southern kingdom, and they scoop up these Samaritans, and they scoop up these Jewish people living in Jerusalem, and they haul them off across the desert. This in scripture is called the exile. Now when the Samaritans come back to their hills and to their landscapes and to their homes, they rebuild. And when the Jewish people come back to Jerusalem and back to their lands and to their hills, they rebuild, which is what you and I would do when we are able to return back to the life that we come to know. We start cleaning things up and rebuilding and, and reshaping our lives. The Samaritans decide that they no longer want to hop in their cars or their carts or their buggies and, and make the road trip all the way down to Jerusalem to go to the temple to worship God. They decide that they're going to build their own house of worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. Forgive me if I pr- pronounce it wrong. But that's the mountain that she's pointing to. On this particular mountain, they've built their own house of worship. Now, they understand it's the same God. They understand that this is their God, and not just their God, but this is all people's God. But they've built this house for themselves where they can worship. But then we start seeing a bit of a a culture war begin to develop between the Samaritan people and the Jewish people. And this culture war escalates into a real war, so that about 150 years before Sam and Jesus are hanging out at this well, Sam's people and Jewish's people, Jesus' people, the Jewish people and the Samaritan people, they go to war with each other, and the Jewish army marches up into Samaria because this is a war, and they destroy that house of worship. This is no longer just a minor social distancing that is happening between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. This is a divide. This is a wall. They are not to be interacting with each other, and I know You and I are not at war with each other. We are not at war with our neighbors. We are not at war with anybody on this planet. We are all trying to find ways to respond to this health crisis. And so we are bringing it upon ourselves to create social distance. So yes, there is a difference, a very clear difference between what's going on with Sam and Jesus and what's going on with you and me. At the same time, We understand the pain and the disappointment and the frustration that exists when two people see each other from across the street or may see each other from the windows of their living rooms, but we cannot physically interact with each other. We know the disappointment and frustration and wanting to be near each other, to to gain God's wisdom from each other, to share and break bread with each other, but we can't do it. And we can't do it not because we're being held back by the government. It's not as if there are storm troopers marching up and down our streets or anything like that. We are not under some National Guard force quarantine, but we are doing this for the sake of the vulnerable members in our community. We are doing this for our health care providers. We are doing this for EMS and fire personnel so that we can manage this situation. 
so that we collectively can potentially keep up with this fast-moving virus. But still, we are being driven apart. So even as Sam is talking to Jesus, and she's talking about how she worships on this hill, and Jesus worships on that hill over there, and we are not really supposed to be interacting with each other, we can imagine in her voice a little bit of disappointment because she's talking with this guy who she recognizes to be a spokesperson for God. She does not know yet until Jesus says, I am, which is the secret code word in the Gospel of John. When Jesus says, I am, that particular phrase, then people begin to realize that Jesus is God. Up to that moment, she knew that she was a spokesman for God. She knew that he reflected God, that he somehow represented God, but she did not know that this was God who she was talking to just yet. Now she knows. And now she gives thanks. And at the same time, she knows she has some hesitation and some trepidation. And Jesus names where they are. Jesus acknowledges that, yes, there is social distance between you and me. There's social distance between us and our neighbors, even between us and our loved ones. We can't go to Pinecrest. We can't go down the street and see our own people who we care about. But it will not last. Yes, in this moment, you, Sam, worship here, and I worship here. But the day is coming, and it is soon, friends, when we will be together again. This social distancing will end. Our divisions between ourselves will end. All the divides and the walls and the borders and the fences, all the reasons that we create to keep ourselves separated from each other, one day it will come to an end because God is forming us into a new creation every single day. We are being transformed and reformed, redeemed and renewed by baptismal waters, these living poured into our lives, waters that shape us and restore us. We are being made new. This is Jesus' promise that we are not alone because Jesus will find us at the well. Jesus will find us at the kitchen table. Jesus will find us wherever we are and stand with us. Name us for who we are without judgment. Love us for who we are without judgment and continue on with us. I would love for this to be an evangelism sermon. This would be the point in the sermon where I would say, friends, rise up from your pews and blast out through that door and go tell your neighbors that Jesus is with them as much as Jesus is with you. Tell them the promise that Jesus loves us and forgives us and redeems us. And Jesus walks with us into this world that we are being bound together. I can't say that today. And that's hard to an empty space full of empty pews But friends, I can see you. I can see where you sit. I can imagine you in your homes. I can imagine you on the couch. I can imagine you now maybe sitting at the office desk. We are in this together. Jesus has bound us together through living waters. We are one body. And whether you are worshiping at home, or you're worshiping from a hospital bed, you're worshiping from your phone, your tablet, your computer, if you're worshiping by watching TV and some preacher or some TV show comes on and it tells you something about God, that doesn't matter because we are doing this together. We are finding our path together. And at the moment, we are separate. And it is hard. And it is frightening. And at the same time, Modeled by the Samaritan woman, we can be fearless. We can be dynamic. And we can witness Jesus moving in our lives. We can continue to call and pray for our elderly. We can call and pray for our family. We can reach out to those who are hunger and food deprived. People who are struggling and forced to go to work even though they don't have sick days, but they might be feeling sick. We can pray for our kids who may depend on food when they go to school and may not now have that food. We can still stand together. We can still walk together, led by Christ, who reminds us that he is with us, leading us, reforming us, transforming us by living water. Because Jesus knows who we are. And Jesus knows what we are capable of. We continue on this journey together, my friends. We love each other. We pray for each other. We share our hope with each other. The day is coming, and it will soon be here, 
where we will no longer be divided, but we will stand together. I cannot wait for that day. Until then, we hold each other in prayer, we hold each other in our thoughts, and we walk with each other. Amen.